Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please come, keep coming. Um, we're about to start. Uh, yes, my name is Ivan Krylov, and I work for a company called Azul Systems. I will uh, say a couple of words about the company at the very end. And this is a talk about the low-level stuff. And so you might be wondering, where am I? So this is a talk about Java virtual machine internals um, in, and a little bit about performance. And therefore, I guess you are, you are here because you either have a general interest and curiosity about those kinds of things, or maybe you, um, you work on a, uh, on a performance critical application. And in order to understand the possible performance problems that you might have, it's, it's a good thing to have to build a proper mental model, a big picture of how things work inside of Java Virtual Machine. Um, there are many parts to it, but I will be covering um, th things that are related to just-in-time compilers, so I won't be talking about garbage collection or things of that nature. Um, I understand that some of you come from the .NET world uh, more than Java world. Um, for the most part, this talk will be um, generic enough to be applicable to .NET things as well, um, but of course towards the end there will be more examples and uh, you know, some APIs that are specific to, specific to Java and, and JVMs. Um, so we'll, first I'll give a, a kind of a big, old, big picture overview. Um, for some of you, the, this is stuff is known, but I just don't want to be everybody on the same uh, page. Then we'll talk about the, uh, what are the code profiles and why they collected and what they consist of and, the, and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about two kind of top level um, criteria or top level um, uh, components to compilation that's inlining and de-optimization, and I'll specifically cover what the optimizations are and why, um, why they happen and how to prevent. And uh, towards the, so these four, the first four items are, like I said, they are fairly generic. Uh, the final one that will be, I will be talk, cover a few APIs about how to control just-in-time compilation. Uh, that's where things get a bit more vendor-specific. Um, and in this section, I will also cover the stuff that I'm working on uh, with, along with my team, and that's where it gets very much very specific, which is us. Uh, but we'll get there towards the end. Um, all right, so the, the overall uh, code flow inside JVM has not changed for the last 17 or 18 years uh, since just-in-time compilers were introduced. So you write a code originally in Java, you know, typically. Um, that's the most popular source of uh, bytecode. And you pass it over to Java C compiler. A Java C compiler um, does uh, syntax verification, some sort of static verification. Um, and it also does uh, some amount of optimization, but very limited. It's near zero. Uh, the reason is that Java C compiler can only view a certain, only a current uh, compilation unit, um, namely the given source file. It does not do any sort of interprocedural analysis. Um, so you can get some primitive, some very simple uh, conditionals el eliminated, but otherwise the bytecode that's produces, that produced by Java C is, contains the same logic as uh, that's there in the source file. So the bytecodes go into uh, the Java virtual machine. That's how it's being executed. Uh, the runtime uh, reads those bytecodes. Um, it does the dynamic verification. It needs to do so because, well, who knows who compiled those uh, bytecodes. Mm, who created them, and also it needs to do, among other things, linking. Um, if you look, ever look at this assembly of a bytecode, and we'll have an example of that uh, later in the, in the talk, uh, what you will see is like when you call method uh, in, in the class foo, method bar, it actually contains those string literals. You know, find out literal, foo literal string literal bar, compose a string out of that, and find me a method somewhere that corresponds to this fully qualified name and transfer control over to that one. Now, understandably, this is a fairly slow uh, process, and so linking does the patching so that we only perform it once, and, um, and after, that, after that, we straight go to, straight to the address corresponding to that method. Um, interpreter picks up this bytecode, and it does uh, its job. So it basically, the code that you code, that you've written, uh, gets execu executed. But along with that, uh, interpreter collects uh, profiles. Uh, that we'll talk about those in, in a couple of slides. Those profiles are being collected. Um, it includes things like uh, number of times the method was executed, uh, number of back branches. 
And uh, those profiles are fed into just-in-time compiles. So when the method becomes hot enough, the runtime decides to compile method. method. So it sends it to compiler for compilation. Uh, compilers are, well, they're single-threaded, but they're multiple compilation threads. So multiple methods can get compiled at the same time. And uh, methods, uh, so, me so compilers take the text, the body of method, you know, the actual logic, along with those code profiles that, that we collect to produce those optimal compilations. And once those are ready, um, we, on the next evocation of this method, we go straight to machine code. Um, there is a, this tier arrow, uh, which denotes that when, when method becomes super hot, it may be recompiled with a higher tier compiler uh, to gain us even more benefits and even more performance, or maybe more throughput. And um, sometimes the optimizations happen, and I'll talk about the optimizations. And if those happen, then the transfer goes over to interpreter back again. And we are therefore in this, uh, in this cycle of, of, of uh, in this life cycle. So that's the big picture. Now, uh, almost, yes, and in Java 9, um, there is uh, this ahead of time compilation mode. So Java 9 is what, less than a year old. Um, that's where uh, compiler prepares machine code in advance, and it goes straight into this kind of machine code execution. Uh, but uh, because of possible deoptimization, it's still subject to the same kind of life, life cycle. So that's the only change that happened in Java 9. Before that, this picture was nearly the same for the last uh, over 10 years. Um, almost everything can be different in this picture. Um, well, first of all, Java C is not the only compiler. There's like something like 80 uh, VM languages out there. They all produce bytecodes. There are also uh, bytecode transformation utilities. There are bytecode generations, uh, ge generators. Uh, so quite a few sources of bytecode that may come. And VM has to be agnostic and only needs to acknowledge the, the JVM specification, not any assumption that this was generated by this compiler or that compiler. Um, some, uh, there, were, there was a uh, virtual machine called JRocket that didn't have an interpreter at all. Uh, it instead it had a very lightweight uh, tier one compiler that was doing the job that I was just explaining to you what interpreter does. Uh, so interpreter is not strictly needed, but then there's a, there can be a lower tier compiler that can do the same. Um, sometimes, sometimes people are working on new features and the easiest thing to, the easiest thing to implement a feature in a language itself is to disable compilers altogether and only implement it in an interpreter. And that's how you typically jumpstart on, on a new VM or new language feature. Also, if there is no port for a particular platform, um, the easiest thing is to get an interpreter running, and that's when people disable interpreter. And finally, about ahead of time compilers. Um, now, by ahead of time, we usually mean that something that, that is compiled once in advance and never recompiled again. Pure ahead of time compilation is strictly not possible due to the limitations of the language itself, or I should say the features, not the, not, not the limitations. The fact that we can, at any given moment, we can load a new class, um, and we can construct a URL of the flying and get a, get a new class from the air, uh, basically shows the fact that there is no whole world state known to, the comp to any given compiler. And therefore, um, the, the whole world compilation like it's done in, let's say, C++, isn't quite possible. However, there are hybrid approaches. Uh, Excelsior-Jet has been out there for over 10 years. They've been doing that. Now, uh, Java 9 ahead of time compiler is mostly doing the same. So parts of codes are compiled with ahead of time compiler um, to sort of to accelerate the startup and uh, when we have those features like, uh, when we have those situations when we load new class or we redefine existing class, uh, that's where it's all transferred to the just-in-time completion. So that's the big picture. Um, now I mentioned uh, compilation tiers. What are those? Well, let's say you run Java and something simple like Hello World, and you specify this print compilation option in the command line. And you will see something like this. Uh, you will see you know, which methods are being compiled. You will see various numbers, um, the uh, timestamp, uh, the job number, or the completion number. And here you'll see numbers from 0 to 4. And those are uh, compilation tiers. So what are those? Well, these are, these are the five tiers that exist right now in Hotspot. Um, so at the, at the bottom, you have an interpreter. Um, 
And at the top, you have uh, C2 uh, slowly being replaced by Graal compiler, but uh, at least for now, uh, the default compiler is C2, so I'll be talking, saying C2 when I mean top-level compilation. And there are three tiers in between. And given that the interpreter is the slowest and the C2 compiler produces the fastest, the most throughput um, uh, cut code, you might be thinking, well, maybe those are numbered in the sort of in the throughput you get from those compilers. In reality, they are actually uh, numbered the re reverse way. Uh, the numbering happens from uh, the amount of produced machine code or the amount of complexity built into those compilations. So let me explain to you quickly what full profile limited and no profile means here. So when you start an application, uh, you typically start with an interpreter, and after method heats up a little bit, uh, you recompile it, uh, or well, I would say you, but I mean GVM recompiles it with uh, C1 with full pro pro profiling. And when that one runs for a while, it collects even more profiling data, and VM observes this as being a hot one, it then enqueues it for tier 2 compilation, for C2. And when that happens, you know, the method will be promoted to tier 2, and that's what we want to run. But C2 compiler is relatively slow, and therefore there's a new scheme, there's, a not, there's an alternative scheme. So when runtime detects that comp the compilation queue for tier 2 is long enough, that it, uh, the code will have to run in the slow mode uh, of tier three relatively, uh, relatively much uh, time. Uh, the code uh, is compiled with limited profiles, so only invocation and back branch counters. Back branch are the like in the for loop, how many times it looped back to the beginning. Um, when the queue becomes somewhat empty, it's promoted to uh, tier one uh, C one compiler with full uh, profiling, and then over to C two. Uh, in some situations, uh, um, uh, C1 compiler is disabled alt altogether, um, in which case the interpreter does all the job. And, and when uh, interpreter collects all the profiling data, uh, the promotion goes straight to C2. And uh, finally, in some cases, it's found that uh, C2 compilation will not be beneficial at all. So when instead, uh, it goes from tier 3 to 1, which basically is stripping out all the profiling instructions and leaving pure C1 compilation, which is still faster than tier three. So these are the current uh, compilation tiers. Um, interpreter is essentially a, a uh, tier zero compiler. So when you think about an interpreter, you might think, okay, so there's, this is a specification. Let's say I'm, look, I'm reading through the bytecode sequence in a, in a virtual machine. Maybe interpreter works like, okay, there's some memory structure. I'm reading instruction, I'm reading it parameters. I evaluate the, the result of this, um, of this instruction. I put, put it in on the side structure in this side memory buffer. Um, e, uh, that could work, and that's how usually, let's say, students implement an interpreter. Uh, but uh, the hotspot template interpreter is way more efficient. It is actually a snippets of assembly that, are, that contain some holes, that's why it's called template. Those, temp those, uh, those holes are populated with addresses of actually created VM, uh, VM structures on the fly when VM is first um, created. And um, so the interpreter uh, maintains number of invocations and back branch counters. It maintains a mixed Java native frames. Uh, so um, those size there's no size structure. Everything is actually on the native stack. Um, and I, um, and it all together, it looks like a, a very large go-to, unless there's a call into, into runtime to, for some specifics. Um, overall, it looks like just a huge go -to, uh, routine with a bunch of go-tos in between every instruction. Uh, I do have an example of like how, to, how this actually is implemented in assembly, um, but um, I figured that this might be a fairly lengthy one for, for this talk, so I'll skip this slide, but I can get to this uh, during question and answers if needed. Instead, let's talk about the code profiles. What are those? Uh, well, code profile is a, is a set of counters. Um, code profiles are needed to describe to the VM how a particular method was executed previously during this warm-up phase. So you have a method, and you have if-else if branches, and inside of those, you might have also some other if-else branches or, or switch case statements. The EVM would like to know which branches are more likely to happen and which branches um, are never taken. Uh, this way we can um, optimize for the cases when we actually do hit those if conditionals and, and leave out and not out compile or not optimize for cases which we don't care really about. 
those numbers uh, that are associated with all of those conditionals and branches are fairly are somewhat accurate. They are not completely accurate, so you have to look at those through the native debugger. They are not uh, precise. The reason is that you might be running the same method in two parallel threads, and if you want to have the exact counters, you would have to take uh, do some sort of locking or implement even more complex lock tree algorithms. In order to avoid that, uh, we just simply increment those counters, and if we miss by one or two, it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is the ratio between, let's say, the if and the else branch in any given code. Once the numbers have reached a certain level, uh, high enough, they stay saturated. Um, some numbers do come with properties. Um, for example, let's say you have a method and you pass a, an interface uh, as a parameter. Now, when you actually call that method, you, you call not an interface, but you pass an object of a, some given class that implements that interface. Um, the code profile captures what classes have been passed to that, to that method uh, so that it can optimize for those classes specifically. It doesn't, and in cases when, um, when well, it, actually that's in most cases, you only see uh, two or three classes being actually used in that method, and we can optimize for those particular cases and not do the, the virtual call logic, which, is, which can be relatively expensive. I'll get to that in the inlining section. Um, yeah, so, we do, do we, uh, so with some counters do have properties, mainly to capture which Java types are being observed. So there's a, a file and, and corresponding structure in, in the hotspot, um, and if you ever look there, uh, the main things you will see is the number of invocation and back branches that were taken. And there are some helpful counters, like how many exceptions did we throw? And yes, that's a reminder, don't try to use exceptions as a natural code flow for application, because they are treated completely separately in, in the VM, or a number of breakpoints and other facilitating counters. And about ba based on that, this is sort of information that's been used by compiler to generate uh, a more efficient just-in-time compiled code. Um, let's get into inlining. Um, so I guess many of you have heard that inlining is sort of important for compilers. And this is a sort of a question that you get asked if you ever go to, a, a, let's say, an interview for either performance position or compiler position. And the answer would be, yeah, of course, because when you, when you let's say, inline a code, you save on the cost of passing an argument, preparing an argument for the callee. Or on the callee side, you save the cost of reading those arguments because Naturally, or in most cases, uh, argument passing happens through, um, through, through the stack. Now, there are, there are ABIs that which allow you to pass limited number of arguments through registers, which is much more efficient, but you have a more than, uh, let's say, three or four arguments, you still need to go through the stack. Um, also, when you have uh, one method inlined into another, um, it becomes more uh, iCache friendly, so uh, cache, I, uh, iCache predictor can fetch more instructions in advance. Um, it makes executable smaller in some cases, so it really might very much depends on the, on the graph of, of calls that you have. But most important, above all of that above, is that uh, when you inline one method into another, it unblocks a whole bunch of other possible optimizations. And those are the classic optimizations that you may have seen or heard um, from, from university. These are known from 70s, uh, like loop uh, switching, unswitching, loop unrolling. Uh, invariant um, uh, hoisting, um, constant code motion, and a whole bunch of other optimizations. There's like dozens of them. Uh, these are fairly well studied and known, um, but because uh, none of the JIT compilers can really do interprocedural analysis on, like when the when methods are completely separate, uh, these only happen when one method gets aligned into another. Um, so, th so these uh, optimization happen because our essentially our compilation log block is bigger. There are more instructions being observed, and we can uh, the compiler can do a lot better job. Um, a simplest example or simplest test you can do: take any any application that you care about in terms of performance, uh, just disable in landing with a slag, and see what happens to it. I uh, it, I did this bug once. Uh, I did I was working some code, and uh, happened so that I disabled about a quarter of inlining decisions that used to happen that, that stopped happening because of that bug. And I also saw a drop in performance about uh, by 25%. Um, so that is a, an important part of compilation. You can see with print inlining which, inlines, which method actually got in line. That gives you a hint on what, what compiler was doing. 
And perhaps uh, this will also hint you on how to help the compiler to inline even further if you think that would be critical. Uh, so what things drive inlining? Um, this is a little bit of terminology. Top level method is the one that's, that is scheduled for compilation. Now then it lines um, down the tree, and there is always a, a pair of caller and callee. So caller calls, callee is the one that's being called, and these are the potential candidates for inlining. Uh, the just-in-time compiler will first look at the size of a callee. So I have the size of x with the compile method. If I inline that, my compile code will probably be a little bit bigger. Um, the old compilers uh, like C2 do this estimation very, very roughly. They look at the size of a bytecode, so of the original code, um, and do the math and you know, sum together and, and make a decision whether it's worth aligning or not. And more modern compilers like Falcon or like Graal, uh, they look at the size of the IR, so the intermediate reason presentation, uh, which is uh, somewhat more efficient. Furthermore, uh, modern compilers do a number of iterations. So we'll try the first wave in lining, then do some coding maybe through some of those optimizations. Some, the code will reduce and shrink a little bit. But this will give us some room for further in lining. So we do another round. This is an iterative process that at some point stops and, um, and because the, the size of the produced code must be somewhat limited. Um, the inlining is dried by hotness. So if there are two candidates, and we only have budget to inline one of those, uh, we will try and inline the one that's hot, and if it's in cold path, we don't care about it. And uh, another part, important uh, thing is ability to, to de-virtualize. Now in Java, as you remember, all methods by definition are virtual. Um, we can de-virtualize either by looking at the properties, like just like static or, or final method, or we virtualize by analyzing the class hierarchy. And let's say we, had, we, we, we are calling a class, we know this class doesn't have any subclasses or any derived classes, then we can, we can virtualize methods of that class when those are called. So this is all together, it's called class hierarchy analysis. It's present in every virtual machine and it's also very, very uh, helpful to just -com compilers. Um, so inlining may not happen because of several reasons. Like first two, are kind of obvious, either with the compiled method is way too big, or we are uh, doing some sort of a recursive call and this uh, recursion is getting too deep. Those are all rulable with the, with the specific flags and hotspot. Uh, there are a couple of more cases. Uh, usually, if Kali has exception handlers or Kali is synchronized, those usually do get in line, I mean, at least that's not the hindrance, but uh, maybe in the production you have a, sort of a, a script or environment where this, these two options that are in the brackets are disabled. In that case, uh, the lining doesn't happen. And it's up to, uh, let's say, the component provider sometimes to provide this set of options. So if you see those, um, that's those, those options with these names, that's what they mean. Um, so if a class is not initialized, um, uh, so we get to the method and there's some cold path and we, uh, by trying to inline the method in that cold path, chances are that the the holder of that method may have not been initialized, and in this case, we don't even try to. And although in Java C it's not possible to produce unbalanced monitors, but with some other Java C compilers it could be, or so with some other bytecode manipulating routines. So if a colleague has those unbalanced monitors, the inlining will not happen. And there was a peculiar case about the JSR bytecode, um, and there is a blog post I'm just mentioning for the reference. Uh, you, it's from 10 years old, but still relevant. This bytecode is not used by Java C compiler, but other compilers might be doing it, might be using it. So it's there for the reference. Uh, enough, now, uh, enough now about inlining. Let's talk about deoptimization. So it's, as you remember, it's an arrow back from compiled code back to interpreted code. Um, deoptimization is happening because just-in-time compilers do a whole bunch of optimistic or heroic optimizations. Um, that's something that a typical ahead-of-time compiler cannot simply do uh, because it has no machinery to recover, while Java Virtual Machine has this machinery to recover from incorrect assumptions. And we'll talk about those assumptions a, bit, a little bit later. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, okay, so not all optimizations are speculative. Um, the, I sort of consider that um, optimizations are divided into three types. There are some deterministic ones. Um, those are the, the classical optimization, again, known for, for, 
theory, from theory of compilation from 70s and 80s, and that's what uh, nearly all modern compilers do in almost any language. Those can never fail. Those, those will always be true. There are some that, uh, that I call specul speculative with fallback, which means that either uh, if the condition for this uh, optimization don't hold true anymore, it's either suboptimal but still legal to run this code, or uh, we, we hit a, something called trap, um, which is like a trampoline to a handling routine. And in that uh, trampoline, in that handling routine, we basically continue execution of this method in an in interpreter, which is slow, but still correct. And, and all virtual machines have this machinery to jump from compile code in the middle of execution, not at every point, but in the middle of uh, it anyhow, uh, into an interpreter and continue running there. Uh, and it's possible and it's perfectly legal to state leave this method and, and the next thread or the next invocation can still try to enter this method once again. And then there are some on the right which are, re require a hard stop. Uh, if those situations are detected, uh, then we must discard this compilation and never use it again. That's typically related to either new class loading and therefore invalidation of the analysis that was done on the class hierarchy or uh, Zing has this optimization over effectively final fields. Um, so when you declare a final field in Java, uh, the compiler may assume that, okay, so since it's a final, it's probably an immutable, but then you can take a hammer called unsafe uh, or reflection and modify that, that value. Now we are able to detect that um, and recover from this kind of error, but if we did any compilation based on the assumption that this field is a constant, we now need to discard this compilation and because the constant has changed. So we do that. Those are the speculative optimizations with the hard stop. Um, one of the interesting difference between, let's say, um, C and Java is when people write a code like this, which is, I didn't, maybe you can see it from the back, but I'll just explain. There's nothing too specific about it. It's just a, um, a processing of vector with some arithmetic. And this code would look pretty much the same, this vector processing would look pretty much the same uh, on, on C and Java. And people have uh, this sort of expectation that if I compile with Java, C compiler and Java compiler, it's gotta, be, it's gotta be having the same throughput. Well, the difference is though that in C++ there was no verification. And let's say if you divide by zero, well, the, the, this code crashes and it exits immediately. Where in Java, you expect if division by zero happened, uh, an arithmetic exception is thrown and, the, and Java code itself can handle this exception and recover from this and keep on going. So um, this verification is mandatory by the language specification and uh, there are a bunch of things that are happening sort of underneath in this code that uh, you may not think in the beginning. So when you create an array, it's nullified, so it's zeroing of object, checking on out of boundary conditions, so checking that you don't go uh, outside of the boundary of, of a given vector. Um, yeah, divide by zero that I mentioned before. Uh, the check that when you try access um, a reference on an object that it isn't null, and if it's null, then it's got to throw a null pointer exception, but, but not the should not crash. Um, so this is the difference between managed and unmanaged languages. And because just-in-time compiler applies those optimistic optimizations or heroic optimizations, it can get rid of most of those checks or make those much cheaper. And because of doing that, it can then achieve the same kind of throughput that uh, the unmanaged language or uh, you know, standard um, uh, ahead-of-time compilation compiler would produce. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of other checks going on. Uh, when a particular assumption fails, we need to record it somehow, and go, it's recorded back in the same code profile that I was mentioning before, um, and it's, called, it's recorded as, well, these are the optimizations that happened before. Some are recorded on per BCI, um, per BCI uh, granularity. BCI stands for bytecode instruction, so per bytecode, essentially, that we are running, and others on a per method. And um, I'm gonna quickly scroll through, scroll, through, um, scroll through, because these are, there's quite a lot to go through uh, if, I, if I were to mention each of those, but the bottom line is that 
When any of those checks fail, the runtime will record those in code profile and will not do the same sort of mistake when recompiling that code. Now, I should mention to you that, um, yes, it will not do the same sort of mistake when recompiling <laughs> this method during the same run. But if I run the same application tomorrow, uh, that application would, not, would have a blank uh, new code profile and will likely to hit into the same kind of pitfalls, the same sort of traps over and over again. So a logical question would be like, OK, is there a way to persist this sort of information so the compiler doesn't do these mistakes to, uh, on, the, on the following run? Um, and I'm going to get to this towards the end of the talk, because we have developed an API more or less to do exactly that. Um, I mentioned in that middle column that there are optimizations, there are failures of specula speculations that we can recover from. For example, we were processing an array of a million elements, and somewhere in the middle, uh, we encountered a zero, um, a zero element. We tried to divide by zero. And we can continue that loop execution in the interpreter, and when we'll return back to this, uh, this code, the question is, should this code be recompiled now verifying that, OK, if element is zero, throw exception. If not, do the arithmetic. Now, that's a slower version that we had before. But at the same time, if we, let's say, have the rest of the array filled with zero, then on every execution, we'll be hitting this divide by zero and then and, and trample into interpreter and resume with interpreter. That's also very slow. So there is a trade-off between keeping that old method entrant, what we call method entrant, so still available for execution, versus recompiling it. And this is a very fine balance that we need to decide. And again, we looked at about this, and the best way to make a judgment about what, what to do in these situations is actually look at the historic data, at the profile that we maintain in between the runs. Um, and only our VM, as far as I know, can do that. Um, and I'll get to that mechani mechanics at the, at the end. Another, particular, uh, another interesting problem uh, is when are we able to compile? So in a natural the kind of diagram of like interpreter go, it's going to, to just in time compiler, that is not a problem, because everything is initialized by the time compiler kicks in. So that is not a problem. But all ahead of time compilers face uh, this sort of a problem that I'll, that I'll be just describing on the next slide when they try to uh, compile methods ahead of time. Uh, let's look at this example. Again, um, apologies to guys in the back, but I will, I will kind of explain what's going on. On the left, we have class A, and it consists only of static uh, fields. And it, in particular, it has a static initializer, which gets initialized with a timestamp. So because it contains its timestamps, it's important to know it, it, there is a difference when the class is initialized, in the beginning or in the middle of a program run. On the right, we have a method that just uses class A in some form. And let's say we know that the method on, in class B that's on the right is going to be hard, and we, we want to compile it in a ahead of time fashion. So we can compile this method on the right only when class A initialize, is initialized. That's what we need uh, for compilation. But at the same time, this method A, by the specification, by language specification, is allowed uh, to be initialized only when it's first used. Uh, and a lot of frameworks rely on this fact. Um, so for in this particular case, if class A is first used, like one hour after the beginning of the run of the program, the timestamp that it contains that it's being created in the static initializer uh, must, be, must be equal to that value of one hour, one hour past the beginning of the, of the program start. And we cannot violate that. We cannot pre-initialize this class in advance because this would break the semantics. And again, a lot of frameworks apparently rely on that. So this seems a bit of a chicken and egg problem. That is something that within the language is hard to solve. And the best, uh, the best way to address this is just to be aware of these dependencies when you run your code or, or when you write your code or when you design your code. Another example of that kind is Java enum. So um, especially for me, a person from C++ background, um, like enum is basically something, something must be really simple, just like a number. 
uh, a number with, with, with a string letter corresponding to it so that I don't have to type a number, but instead of I type this word, which corresponds to that, that value. Okay, so in Java, the source code on the left is only 30 bytes long. But if you compile it, it will be 20 times bigger. And you might be wondering, okay, so bytecode is a compressed binary format, but somehow simple code on the left becomes 20 times bigger when it's compiled to bytecode. So there must be some sort of complex machinery going on behind the scenes. Well, indeed, um, I will zoom in here. So this is the entire disassembly of a class. And this is uh, here, now that I'm zoomed in, this is a disassembly of a static class initializer. Now, it turns out that the way that enums are supported in, in Java is that, um, okay, so you have this string, string literal on the left, so it will pick up the string literal from a constant pole, call a constructor on an element. Uh, now it will contain an object. Now, since we only have one element in this, in this enum, there will be no more calls, but then it creates a vector of values. And once the vector is created, uh, this value is put into that vector. Uh, this constitutes the num that we can now use in, in Java. Uh, if you recall the syntax of enum, then this is the simplest enum, but other enums might have uh, uh, sp uh, special constructors and other sorts of logic bound, bound into it. All that logic happens in the static initializer. And because this static initializer is now becoming complex, we go back to the problem that I displayed in the previous slide of that chicken and egg problem. And therefore, code that's using enums in, um, in code, are that, that sort of code is hard to compile in ahead of time mode, whether it's our compiler that's developed by Zing or whether it's Oracle Hotspot. All of them sort of are, are subject to this sort of problem. OK, um, now we are, yeah, we're good on time. Um, let's talk a little bit about, how much do I have? Oh, okay, I don't have much time, um, apparently. Well, we started late, so I think, I figure I, I have a few minutes more. Uh, this is A380 uh, flight deck, and uh, let's talk a, a little bit about the APIs that we have. Uh, well, since Java 5, we have this legacy compile command format. Um, so it's basically a text file that you can supply to VM, and VM will, according to, will act according to the rules that you specified. The language is extremely simple, and the set of commands is very, very limited. You can really say, yes, those commands can be supplied through a text file or through the GCMD command. Um, you can say either, like, exclude this, this method from compilation or definitely compile this method. Or you can say inline or don't inline this particular method in this class in all compiles. And that's pretty much all it can do. Um, so it's very simple. Um, so it's been there since Java 5. Um, in Java 9, uh, so that's uh, API number two, there is a rework of this API. The syntax become a lot more rich. Uh, you can do all sorts of um, filtering. Uh, but in essence, you, you specify basically the same kind of actions. Never compile this method or always compile this method. Always inline it, don't, never, don't ever inline it, and so forth. Um, beyond that, you can specify flags that would control output of some VM diagnostics, like uh, let's say print assembly. You can, if you do just print assembly for the entire program, then every method that's being compiled in the entire run, there can be thousands of them, will will dump assembly into your into your console. Now, with this option, with this directive, you can control so it dumps only for a particular method you're interested in, if you really want to look into assembly. Um, yeah, there's many more directives. So the syntax is fairly rich, but um, it is kind of very kind of manually uh, that you control the compilations. Okay, um, the, th the third one is an interesting one. There is a class, I don't know how many of you have noticed it, but in Java Lang package, there is a compiler class. And um, uh, I'll get to this example in a little bit. OpenJDK doesn't really support it, meaning that if you call something in that class, it will be simply ignored. Uh, but uh, IBM figure out, okay, so if, if we, since this, is, if this uh, class is available in all JDK distributions, we can take advantage of it and build an API. An API looks like, um, you, uh, these, it's a static method, uh, a method like command in class compiler, and any object can be passed to it. Oh, any object, so therefore, can pass a string. 
And that string can contain uh, you know, textual information, compile that method or don't compile that method, or reset compilation, recompile over. So this is the URL um, that contains sort of a description of how they do it. In our VM in Zing, we have uh, pretty much the same, different set of commands, but the same kind of approach. With the compiler.command uh, method, you can uh, manipulate your compiler and, um, and do with it what you like. Um, this API will be deprecated. Well, it is deprecated. It will be eventually removed. But I checked last week, even in early builds of Java 11, the class is still there. So we're using it. So that's number three. Uh, we have two more. Uh, JVM CI, JVM compiler interface, emerged in Java 9. Um, and it is in a, an interface to build a compiler, a just-in-time compiler entirely in Java. So as you know, Graal is written entirely in Java. And it needs some support from, from VM. And that support is obtained through this interface. Um, so it is very powerful, but so far, Graal are the only people that are using it. And it's not a, exactly to control the kind of top-level commands like compile or don't compile. It's, it's uh, like reading constable fields and, and, and reading various gory details of virtual machines. So using it uh, from the box is far from trivial. I'm hoping to build an example one day, but I haven't so far. And now we're getting to stuff, the stuff that I've been working on for the last, let's say, three years. It's something called ReadyNow. It's part of our uh, VM. And it's uh, sort of in between ahead of time and just-in-time compilation, namely that the compilation happens when you kick a VM, when you start a VM, but not when method becomes hot. The method become, so when method that method becomes home, the compilation will be already available. Um, I was telling you about the optimizations, how they, these mistakes of uh, premature optimization or the mistakes of uh, heroic optimizations repeat over and over each day. But because we persist that profile, we are able to eliminate those. Works reasonably well if, um, if you're running more or less the same application with the same kind of data day to day. And that's what people typically use it for. And yeah, if profile didn't work out, there's a fallback to normal JIT. So it's, it's a pure enhancement. There's no drawback. The way it works is that, let's say you have three compiled threads, and they're compiling various methods. Um, this activity is recorded in this journal on the right, um, including things like, well, OK, so what, are the, what is the class hierarchy that we have observed during this compilation? Uh, what's the, have we ever seen a null reference being used in this being attempted to be used in this method. So the things that I uh, showed in the beginning, part of the code profile, it's all serialized and recorded in this profile. And um, yeah, this is probably too small font, but um, there is the, on the left, there's a, a snippet of, a, of our uh, reading now profile, which is a text-based file. You can read it. It's, it's machine readable, but it's also human readable. And it basically uh, contains this live profile that I was explaining earlier uh, through, through, this, through the BCI. So it contains information about every interesting bytecode instruction BCI um, that we encountered. And when we use that, so we, we feed this profile into a virtual machine and it sort of uh, uh, does, the matching, does the matching, and it dispatches compilation jobs to compile threads. And when that is done, uh, we have a bunch of compiled methods that were compiled mostly the same way as they were compiled yesterday. And you have that mu them much sooner. So this is a latency graph. Uh, the blue line there is a latency graph uh, without ready now. Um, it basically shows that there is this warm-up time in the first, um, let's say, fifth or the first minute. So the entire graph is like five minutes. So in the first minute, you have this warm-up. And latency is fairly high in the beginning because, well, compiler needs time to, to compile things. And with ready now, things are uh, more towards the bottom, the green and the, and the purple lines. That's because we provide this information through persistent profile log rather than collecting it live uh, with the help of interpreter and lower tier compiles. So that's what it looks like in production. And we've taken this idea a bit further. So this year, we released something called compile stashing. Um, compile stashing is a way to preserve not the meta information, not the profiles, but the actual compile code. Um, it's different from Java ahead of time compiler that's, let's say, present in Java 9, because we preserve code with all optimizations enabled. Um, so if the matching wor logic worked, and if we are able to prove that this is the right compilation, um, then out of the box you have the most performant compile 
um, possible. Um, it looks a little bit like this. So mm, on the left, you have a uh, virtual machine and its interface to the compiler. On the right, this uh, our new LLVM-based JIT compiler. And they have this interface. And compile stashing is effectively a proxy that watches the traffic, uh, including initial IR. Initial IR is actually you know, like the body of a method plus the code profile. Bound together, it's transformed into LLVM in intermediate representation, initial IR. A set of questions that correspond to the state of the VM. And finally, the produced uh, object, so the produced binary, the result of compilation. It's all, it's all going into this, st what we call stash. And when we are using it, um, the process happens sort of in reverse. Okay, I'm trying to build the same IR and ask the stash, okay, do you have a compiled method for this, uh, for this IR? So have you seen this method before? It says, yeah, I saw this method, and these were the conditions under which this method was compiled. Do those conditions hold still true in this new run? And if the answer is yes, those conditions still, still are applicable, they are still satisfied, then it is legal and perfectly fine to install that binary that's present on the stash. Combining it together, um, again, compile stashing is like a proxy. If we hit a stash, so if a method is present there, then it's just a very quick compilation of a method. If we fail to find this method on the stash, then we continue in, JIT, in, in our JIT compiler. And when the method is produced, we give it back to runtime to install and use. But we also save it on stash so that the next run, you know, on the following day, will use it. Um, so that's part of our commercial v VM called Zing. It has some other nice things, like, for example, our garbage collector can nicely handle um, four and eight, up to eight terabyte of uh, heap. So that's XMX up to eight terabyte. And it has a lot of other, other nice features. We also have uh, something called Zulu. Zulu is our build of OpenJDK. We package it, we test it in a bunch of ways. We produce AWS, Docker, uh, Azure, all sorts of images over, over 200 artifacts with every release. We support 7, 8, 9, 10, planning on 11, um, and we sell support for it. So the binaries are free, uh, um, and usual customers just go for support with us. And we also have an embedded offering, like for MIPS, for ARM. We also prepare custom JDKs. So that is us um, in a nutshell. And yes, that failed picture from the beginning. It's called Hanga. I, I hope I pronounced it right. It's also known as Crazy House in the city of Dalat in Vietnam. And I figure that's an interesting building, an interesting kind of set of interconnections. In a certain ways, it resembles what we do uh, in virtual machines. And that's the house that I live in. Thank you very much.